All attendees have been muted um, so that there isn't background noise during the presentation. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please enter into the chat box and we'll, we'll wait to answer questions until after the presentation. We'll have a formal question and answer session and hopefully we'll be able to get to everybody's questions. Um, but there are a lot of folks joining us tonight. Um, it's your choice whether to share a video of yourself. Um, and if you're experiencing any technical issues, uh, please feel free to send a personal chat to me or my colleague, Becky, um, Becky Kolak, um, who, and we will do our, our best to, to help you as quickly as possible. Um, this is the final lecture in our winter virtual lecture series. Uh, for anybody in the room that's joined us for all of them, congrats, we made it. Um, also, congrats to everyone in general, we made it through winter. And it's, it's fitting that our last lecture is all about gardening and all things green and growth. Um, if you enjoy learning with us, join us next winter when we'll have a whole new slate of exciting virtual programs or join us outside the spring and summer. Um, most notably throughout May, Kelp is thrilled to be part of the Birding Extravaganza, um, which is an annual collaboration between um, Sacred Coast Maine conservation groups, um, us at Kelt, the Brunswick Thompson Land Trust, Harpswell Heritage Land Trust, and Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Um, and we offer events aimed at helping folks identify and learn more about our local birds. Um, and our first offering in the extravaganza is on Saturday, May 7th. You can learn all about it at uh, kennebecestuary.org slash upcoming dash events. Um, a big thank you to tonight's sponsor, the Merry Meeting Bay Trust, as well as all of Kelts members and donors who support our educational program uh, programming like tonight's, um, but who also support the care of the 25 plus miles of trails, our public preserves and the protection of habitat for people and critters of all sizes. Um, thank you for enabling us to do good work. Um, if you'd like to support Kelt with a donation, the easiest way is to hop over to our website, um, www.kennebecestuary.org and click the support menu to give securely online. Um, and then there are also options to give monthly if you prefer. With that being said, um, I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker tonight, Anna Fielkoff, and her wonderful organization, Wild Seed Project. Wild Seed Project encourages using native plants in all landscapes to safeguard wild, wildlife habitat, support biodiversity, and mitigate the effects of climate change. They're a nonprofit organization, and they sell seeds of wild-type native plants. They educate the public through programs like this one. Um, through its website and also through their publications, um, and they promote rewilding efforts in Northeast landscapes. As Wild Seed Project's ecological program manager, Anna Fielkoff uh, works to further the organization's educational programming, deepen relationships with partner organizations, and catalyze the movement to rewild Maine. And before joining Wild Seed Project, she was most recently the senior horticulturist at Native Plant Trust Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts, where she designed and installed native plant gardens, managed interns and volunteers, and taught the public ways to incorporate native plants in their own gardens. With over a decade of experience, Anna brings with her a deep knowledge of native plant ecology, horticulture, conservation, and ecological landscape design. She holds a BA in human ecology from the College of the Atlantic and an MS in ecological design from the Conway School. Welcome, Anna, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Riley. Um, it was really, really great to be invited to speak for as part of the as the last speaker for the winter speaker series. And um, I think that this is fitting because I'm sure everybody is itching to just get out in their gardens if they haven't already and start, you know, seeing what's coming up, what's plant, what what they're going to plant this year. Um, I've been noticing just, you know, going along the roadsides and, and walking around, um, lots of things in bloom like willows and the poplars have mostly gone by at this point and they're already turning to seed, um, as well as blood roots in, in the gardens, um, that have been planted and, uh, the service berries are on their way to blooming. Um, and those are one of my favorites, real harbinger of spring. So I want to chat with you tonight about what it means to be gardening for habitat and for pollinators. Um, and thank you for introducing Wild Seed Project. Um, if you're not as familiar with us, we are a small but growing nonprofit based in Southern Maine. And 
one, one of the main objectives that we have is to educate people about um, and inspire people to take action about with native plants and get them to plant them in their own um, yards, parks, um, uh, all sorts of different kinds of spaces, whether they be rural, urban, or somewhere in between. Um, and people with and without land can plant natives. Um, I actually don't have a garden of my own, but I have a front stoop. Um, I live in Portland, Maine, and I put native containers um, out on my steps for the season. So anyone can really get involved. You can do it at a community garden and um, just wanna make sure that everybody knows that it's accessible to all um, if you wanna be involved with native planting. Uh, we actually have this program called the Pledge to Rewild um, and that is was started in 2020 um, towards the end of the year. And we have gotten over one, you know, 1,500 people who've already taken our pledge to rewild. Um, and that means that, you know, it's people who want to do this in a holistic way. So um, people who take our pledge actually, you know, commit to planting native species where they live, work and play. And then, you know, they, they don't just think about what they're planting, but how they manage their plantings throughout the year to encourage wildlife. And then it really can't be done in a vacuum. So it's all about coming together and um, joining with your community in order to um, get the word out and connect different pieces of fragmented habitat so we can have broader wildlife corridors for, for species to move through with ease. Um, so that's you know the essence of what we're trying to teach at Wild Sea Project. Um, and so I'm going to really talk about what we plant, but also how we manage those plantings to encourage, you know, habitat for all different species of wildlife and especially pollinators. So I just mentioned rewilding and our pledge to rewild. And I want to kind of go back and, and you know, start at the beginning. Uh, why are native plants important in the first place? Um, really, native plants are essential to our local food webs. Um, I have a picture of a native plant, a mountain laurel in here, plus a chickadee, a black cap chickadee and a caterpillar. And those things are all connected because um, we've really followed the work of the research of Douglas Tallamy, um, who's an entomologist at the University of Delaware. And he's written some really wonderful books that I suggest um, you get your hands on if you haven't already. It will really inspire you to plant native for a variety of reasons. but. Um, some of his most recent books are um, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. And then his most, most recent book is actually The Nature of Oaks. So um, I think, you know, if you want to start with anything, I think Bringing Nature Home is a really great introduction to why native plants. But basically his research um, has really shown that um, insect populations are highly dependent on uh, native plants. They've been, they've co-evolved with native plants for thousands of years. And in turn, um, other wildlife that eat insects are dependent on the insects. So birds are one of the major types of um, species that are actually really dependent on insects. And for birds reproductive time in the spring, um, caterpillars are extremely essential. So caterpillars are the larvae or the early stages of moths and butterflies and a few other types of um, life forms. So those moths and butterflies are, you know, some of our pollinators, but also they're extremely important bird food. And recently we have had huge dramatic drops in bird and insect populations. And that just points to, um, some really alarming things, you know, that we're, we're losing habitat and that habitat is the basis of our local food webs as plants. Um, through development, habitat degradation, um, and just not having enough of the native plants in the areas where uh, humans exist. So if we can rewild the, our landscape and restore those native plants, um, adopt more mindful landscape practices that encourage the, insects and pollinators and other wildlife to complete their full life cycles and reproduce, um, then we're going to have higher 
populations of those insects. And then we can also connect those fragmented habitats to encourage that all the more. So um, that's rewilding in a nutshell. And this is the book, Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tellamy. I definitely recommend reading that. Um, and in that book, he, he outlines some, some really important steps to take um, for, you know, getting all these things done. And I think, you know, what we did was we distilled a lot of the, the pieces, the steps that he outlines in that book um, and created um, a program called Rewilding. And that includes 10 actionable steps that everyone can take to rewild their landscape. So um, we often actually give the talk Rewild in 10 Action Steps, and that would be a really good follow-up to this one. Um, but this we're going to kind of hone in on, on how to create habitat more than anything. So one of the major steps actually to rewilding is thinking about shrinking your lawn. And Douglas Tellamy actually recommends that we think about if everybody shrunk their lawns in half, what what a huge ecological impact that would make. Um, lawns are really not useful and they can be actually very harmful um, landscape types. Uh, so, you know, they require the re big resource hogs and they require, you know, major inputs of water. Oftentimes people are fertilizing their lawns to, to keep them nice and green. They're spraying herbicides or other pesticides on their lawns in order to keep the broad leaved weeds out and insect populations out. And some of those things are washing out of lawns when it rains and becoming runoff that goes into water bodies and pollutes them, um, leading to a variety of different um, conditions like um, toxic algal blooms and, and other detrimental things that happen to wildlife from there on out. So, you know, since lawns are, are also relatively sterile places that um, can't really host a lot of wildlife in the first place, there's just, we can do so much better than lawn and lawns don't need to be our default landscape. Um, they are, they still serve a purpose. So I like to think of the lawn as I come from a kind of a designer's perspective. And I always think about, you know, how people move through the space. Um, what are the cues to care? How do we make sure that this is still, you know, a beautiful space to hang out in? And so your backyard might have lawn as the gathering space. Um, you can think of it as an outdoor room that's framed by native vegetation, layers of um, meadow grasses, wildflowers, trees, shrubs, etc. cetera. Um, and then, you know, you can also think of lawn as the places that you know people walk on, conveying people through the landscape, pathways, or you know places for recreation. You, you can play soccer on a lawn, and you can't do that on um, you know a native planting. So lawn is there for a reason, but we just don't need so much of it. The another huge thing that we can all do is just to think about planting native trees. So. I like to think of trees as the scaffolding of our um, landscapes. They really are huge for um, thinking about helping us adapt to and mitigate the effects of climate change. So trees absorb huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere in their trunks, their leafy branches, their root systems, and even deposit that in the soil as they build living soil while dropping their leaves. They also regulate you know, ground temperatures and shade the ground below. Um, so in cities and suburbs, especially, we need trees to cool and shade um, that urban heat island effect. And if we plant native trees, we're going to be bringing on a whole host of ecological benefits and services. So native trees, actually several species are kind of rise to the top, like five species, the oaks, willows, cherries, and birches in terms of their ability to support moth and butterfly species. So that means that those species are eating their leaves and they are in turn as caterpillars feeding songbirds in spring during that really critical reproductive stage. And songbirds actually feed their young on a diet mostly of protein rich caterpillars. You think of it, it's like a perfect little kind of miniature sausage for them, a perfect protein source. Um, and I think oaks 
are at the very top. So I mentioned Douglas Tallamy's book, The Nature of Oaks. He wrote that because if we can all plant more oaks and allow more oaks to thrive in our wild spaces as well, um, then they will be the major, you know, um, the heavy weights in terms of being able to support wildlife, not just the caterpillars, but a whole host of other insects and uh, mammals and birds that rely on them. Um, so, you know, oaks are often a dominant species too in our forests. They're in Southern New England, they sure are. Um, and willows, willows could be, you know, tree willows, like the black willow could be um, the pussy willow that's in bloom right now on our roadsides and wetlands um, and cherries. Cherries are, you know, I featured a cherry here on this page because I wanted to show you, you know, how beautiful some of our native cherries are. are this is a black cherry and this gets to be a good sized tree. Um, it has flowers in spring that um, host a wide array of pollinators. Um, including moths and butterflies and bees. And then in um, the growing season, generally when it's leafed out, it actually is important for so many different species of moths and butterflies. And the Cecropia silk moth especially, um, it, its main, one of its main host plants is the black cherry. The Cecropia silk moth looks almost like a butterfly. It's so beautiful. And it actually is the size of a small bird. It's huge. It's our largest moth, but you might not actually come into contact with it because it's only in this winged adult stage for just a couple days of its life cycle. Um, and it actually doesn't feed during that stage. So it's not a pollinator per se. Um, it's really in its adult stage to reproduce and lay eggs. Um, so they actually come out of their cocoons that they've overwintered in, in spring. The male flies sometimes um, up to a couple miles at night to find the female through its pheromones. It's actually antennae are a lot wider than the females and it's able to, to smell them essentially from afar. Um, and it flies at night. And that's an important thing to know too, because, you know, that's another reason you don't see it. Um, when it finds the female, it mates sometimes for a whole day. And then the female um, will lay eggs on the host plant um, leaves at where the, the caterpillars hatch out from and, and forage on for a good portion of the growing season. And these caterpillars go through different stages. They're start out really tiny, can barely see them, but then they become these kind of chunky monkeys. They're really cool looking with, you know, they're fat and juicy. And then they have these um, red and yellow and blue, like kind of spiky balls on their, that line their bodies. It's really neat. Um, and then they pupate and they, that means they'll form into a cocoon. And for Cecropias in particular, they actually when they form into their cocoons, they hang from the branches of their host plant. And um, then they spend the whole winter um, like that, just overwintering. Um, but there are other species of silk moths and other um, butterflies and, ca and caterpillars that actually spend a lot of their time in the leaf litter. So the luna moth, for instance, many of you might be familiar with, it's absolutely you know one of our most beautiful moths that actually um, drops to the ground from its host tree uh, when it's done, when it's ready to pupate um, at the end of the growing season and will pupate in the leaf litter and spend the whole winter there. So you can think about the implications of that. If you're blowing your leaf litter away, you're interrupting the life cycle of that luna moth and you're not going to be able to um, see it uh, reproduce for the following season. So we can also think about planting small trees and shrubs, especially those are also, you know, many of them are what you would Doug tell me would call keystone plants that host a ton of different moths and butterflies and other insects. Um, and I like the idea of planting some of these small trees and shrubs that are especially you know, tolerant of salt and heat and really tough urban conditions as small street trees or shrubs. So the beach plum, I think, makes a, an ideal street tree um, or growing on the side of a driveway where it might get exposed to salt spray and, and um, other kind of pollutants. Um, but it also flowers in spring and hosts a wide range of pollinators. Um, it's 
fruit is actually, you know, it tastes just like um, a regular plum that you get, would get from the grocery store, but it's much smaller. It's about the size of a, a large cherry. And um, it can become more of a, um, you know, rambling shrub in its natural habitat. It actually grows um, on beaches and dunes, um, sand dunes straight out of sand and will actually form a suckering shrub that's nice and dense and really important as cover for birds and other wildlife and small mammals. So it's a really powerful wildlife habitat um, tree, um, but you can kind of limit up to be a more small, charming tree, which I like the idea of and, and um, you know, be able to layer other plants underneath it. So um, we actually came out last year with a guide on native trees called Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes, and it goes over 31 species of trees, small, medium, and large, and as well as many trees that could be used as street trees. Um, and really, to, it's not for identification, but it's really a guide for figuring out where to put these trees in the landscape, um, their ecological benefits, and just showcasing their beauty and their form. So I recommend people get a hold of that. Um, we are actually coming out with a native ground covers for Northeast Landscapes Guide this spring, and it's actually at the press right now. I'm very excited that it's going to print. So we have the trees, the shrubs, and the, the ground layer. We also have a lot of different species in our native plant palette that are very powerful wildlife um, plants. And asters and goldenrods, a lot of the plants, especially in this fa plant family, which is the, the aster or composite family, are often thought of as those keystone plants too, where they host um, hundreds of um, species of Lepidoptera or those moths and butterflies on their leaves when they're caterpillars that feed on them as caterpillars. Um, and also they're really important late season nectar and pollen sources for bees and wasps and other pollinators. So I, I really like to say if you can, um, anytime you're planting something, include at least one aster, at least one goldenrod. And I think there's an aster and a goldenrod at least for every type of situation. So sunny, dry, wet, mo um, moist, average, you know, there's every, every kind of situation, there's at least one species of aster and goldenrod for. And I just wanna show you a few um, of my favorite, more kind of garden worthy species. Um, the flax-leaved aster is a nice upright aster that actually doesn't get more than six to eight inches tall, so it's nice and short. It can create a really lovely ground cover mixed in with things like bearberry and butterfly milkweed. It really thrives in um, dry, sunny sites, so I could see this also being planted with the beech plum um, at the foot of the beech plum. And then the bluewood aster is very floriferous. Um, that has much tinier flowers. They're kind of light blue, white. And you'll notice that asters, if you look really closely at them, um, they're, the centers are usually yellow at the start, but then they fade to either a brown or a purple after they've been pollinated. So you'll sometimes get this like, oh, this really nice variation in color in looking at the whole flowering top of an aster. Um, and there's even an aster called calico aster, which um, I think this is a really good example of, of that happening. It turns all sorts of beautiful colors. The centers turn beautiful color after pollination. And that basically signals to the other pollinators, I'm done, you don't need to pollinate me. You can pass me by and go to another flower. So um, bluewood aster is um, very billowing and it grows very nicely in more shady gardens, drier shade or moist shade. Um, and then also does a little, you know, does okay with a little sun too. Zigzag goldenrod is on the bottom left. And that is called that because the stems kind of create the zigzagging rhythm um, when you look closely at them. And 
it is a shade loving goldenrod. It's petite. It uh, doesn't get more than a foot and a half to two feet tall. I guess, I guess it, I can, that's a little bit of a lie. It can get almost three feet tall. Um, but it really prefers moist, more rich soils, but can handle some acidic soils too. So this is a really great one for bringing more um, late season wildlife and interest into um, a shady garden, which I know it can be really tricky to kind of um, fill the niche in a shady garden after spring, because really the spring is the shade gardens kind of highlight time with all the spring ephemerals and flowering trees and shrubs. Um, and then wreath goldenrod is more, is very similar to zigzag goldenrod, but it has a narrower leaf and it's what it likes is, you know, dry shade and a little bit of sun too. Um, and I call it, you know, some people call it blue stem goldenrod. I like the name wreath goldenrod because the flowers um, actually come out of the axles between the leaves and the stem and they form this kind of wreath-like um, appearance where, you know, you could pick a stem from it and kind of make a whole um, wreath out of it or a flower crown. It's really beautiful. So I think it, these species also really light up shady gardens. And I'm just a, a big aster and goldenrod nerd, so I could talk to you all day about these species, but I won't bore you for too much longer on these. Um, so I think that, you know, overall, you want to think about planting your garden or your planting in general. It doesn't have to be a garden exactly. It can be a planting on a roadside or um, a meadow or um, the edge of your woodland, but um, you we want to think about planting in layers. So those filling those that vertical structure with um, the canopy trees, the understory trees, shrubs, um, perennials that are a little taller, and then the ground cover perennials. Um, because you want to fill every open niche and stack, pack, and layer as much native plant biomass as you can into a space. That's really how you're going to create the most habitat um, because a lot of these species are going to have caterpillars and other insects crawling on them and foraging on their leaves. There, You wanna have species that bloom at a variety of different times throughout the growing season as well as fruit um, throughout the growing season and into the winter um, so that you can have um, something to forage on for wildlife throughout the whole season. And I think those persistent fruits on um, viburnums and um, dogwoods and other species of shrubs and trees are really important for birds um, into the winter. So, you know, you can even fill vertical layers with vines like coral honeysuckle and American wisteria. And I like for small spaces using containers if possible. Like you can fit a small aromatic sumac that you can see in the, the back corner of this, um, of this photo um, into a container where you might not have the garden space to kind of keep it long-term. So, you know, what you plant is important, but when you, when you're buying your plants at the nursery, I think sourcing plants is more important and critical than you may think. Um, I, I think there's two big rules of thumb for me when I'm going to buy a plant from the nursery. I wanna think about the pollinators first, um, what plants are going to not be harmful for pollinators and what, you know, of course, what species are going to be bringing in and attracting pollinators. But um, you can actually be, inadvertently doing harm to pollinators when buying plants from a big box store like Home Depot, or even a larger nursery that doesn't have good practices, even if have, they have a native line of plants. So um, most nurseries use these really uh, nasty pesticides. They're called systemic pesticides, called neonicotinoids, that um, they can spray on the plant. Um, some get injected into trees, um, but these actually can remain, they go throughout the whole vascular system of the plant and remain in plant tissues for years after you've taken it home and planted it in your landscape. That means that anything that might feed on that plant could be ingesting those neonicotinoids. So especially thinking about the pollinators that in the early stages of their life cycles actually need um, plant leaves, um, they could be affected as well as anything else that feeds on plants, all those herbivores. So um, 
what I like to do is go to, you know, call up the nursery in the winter when they're a lot less busy or on a really rainy day and ask them about those kinds of things. I think it's going to be a consumer driven thing, um, kind of much like organic foods. Um, if more and more people are asking for plants grown without these neonicotinoids, then we're going to be um, provided them, but only if we ask for them. And then I think, you know, thinking about planting for genetic diversity and resilience is important too. And that's something that's usually on the bottom of people's list. But I think, you know, key to our mission at Wild Seed Project is getting seeds out there for folks to not only make more economical decisions and choices about um, buying things that they can grow themselves, but also you can think about um, seed grown plants as a way to get more genetic diversity into the world. So most plants in nurseries are actually cloned and that might be through tissue culture in a lab or it could be through cuttings, um, meaning that when you go to buy a plant at the nursery, um, the other individuals of that species that other people bring home are pretty much exact replicas of what you're getting. They're pretty much the same individual um, with no genetic variability. And that genetic variability is really important for each new generation of plant to be able to adapt to their growing conditions, whether that be this extra stresses of climate change, like increased um, pe pest and disease pressures or um, drought or periods of flooding. Um, or extreme heat. And all of these things are we're facing with the climate turbulence that is here and coming. So growing plants from seed yourself or buying seed grow, grown plants is a way to make our landscapes more resilient. And you can learn more about the ins and outs of buying native plants um, on our website. We have some really good resources that I suggest putting into the search bar and having them come up. So that would be navigating the nurseries is one resource. And then, and that's a great article that walks you through a lot of this. And then where to buy native plants is going to have, um, it's a page that has um, the nurseries that we you know, kind of recommend um, divided up by state. So you can find your state and see what nurseries are near you. So, you know, I want to illustrate the reason that um, what you plant is as important as how you manage your plantings with thinking about um, this life cycle of this pollinator and what it requires. So that is one way you can kind of target um, pollinators to support it's by thinking about one particular pollinator that you're extremely interested in. It might be a certain kind of butterfly, a bee. It could be another, it couldn't, it might be not a pollinator at all. It could be a salamander or a frog. Um, but I think it's a good idea to just do this exercise so you can see what you need to do um, in your garden to make sure you're supporting the most wildlife. And so if you take the life cycle of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, it's a really gorgeous butterfly. Um, and it actually has only a few different host plants. The white turtle has, is its main host plant and in, in the Northeast. Um, and the white turtle head actually notably is, you know, really great pollinator plant for bumblebees specifically. Cause if you look at the shape of its flowers, it has these kind of tubular, uh, or not tubular, but like these closed flowers that are really hard to pry open the petals and get the nectar reward inside. So bumblebees are, you know, um, one of the only pollinators that can, that are strong enough to get in and get that nectar source. But in terms of um, being a butterfly host plant, the white turtle head hosts uh, a wide range of species, but especially the Baltimore checker spot. So the Baltimore checker spot lays its eggs on the turtle head leaf on the underside of the leaf in early spring. And these um, caterpillars actually hatch and um, are gregarious. So they'll stick together throughout, you know, their whole time as caterpillars. They'll crawl up to, you know, one um, stem and start eating all the leaves off of that stem systematically. And then they actually use this protective webbing um, around themselves to protect themselves from um, predation by 
you know, herbivores, et cetera, or birds. And then they also use it to kind of launch themselves from one stem to another. Once they finished all the leaves on one, they actually march over this kind of um, webbing bridge to get to another plant or another stem. And, and I've seen that happen. It's really cool. Um, so then they eat for the course of the whole growing season. And then they crawl down to the leaf litter because they're not ready to pupate yet in their first year. They actually overwinter as caterpillars in that, in the leaf litter. And they're extre extremely vulnerable in that stage. The following spring, they come up and continue eating for a little bit longer to store energy and finally pupate into this gorgeous chrysalis that you see in the bottom right of the slide. So I think that really illustrates that you need the host plants, but you also need something else that's really critical that I mentioned earlier. You need the leaf litter to be intact to allow this species to, to complete its life cycle. So at Wild Sea Project, we actually have signs and we're hoping to redesign these and make them even um, easier for people to spot from afar. Um, but these signs really, you know, give people an idea if you're leaving the leaves um, intact in your garden um, or landscape that you don't need to have your neighbor help you clean it up. You don't need to um, rake them or blow them away. They're actually really important for a wide range of wildlife, including birds. Um, they protect those overwintering pollinators as well as other species that spend parts of their time in the leaf litter, like salamanders and um, bumblebees as well. And they insulate, you know, the leaves insulate plant roots. I think we're having more and more winters where we don't have as much snow cover. And so the leaf that leaf layer is really important to insulate the soil. And as they break down, they are add organic matter to the soil and they build living soil. So really adding to all the different micro and macro organisms that are thriving in the soil. And we have a blog on our website called, a blog post called Leave the Leaves. And it goes into a lot of the detail that I'm speaking about tonight, but can you give you some tips on how to leave your leaves, but also, um, you know, think about aesthetically how your how your garden looks, making making sure it looks cared for, um, and what to do with excess leaves. So I'll talk a little bit about that now. In general, when when we're planning our gardens um, and planning our time to manage them, um, I really think there's three main values that we're all kind of especially us as being interested in wildlife and, um, and native plants, we're really thinking about um, the wildlife value, the aesthetic appeal, because that is important. Um, you wanna make sure that your, that your neighbors and um, people who come and visit think that your garden or your planting is beautiful so that they wanna emulate it. Um, you don't wanna, um, throw people off from wanting to make their own native gardens as well. But also the workload management is a really important thing to think about. You know, are you doing all your work in the fall or are you doing all your work in the spring or can you rebalance it? And I think leaving your leaves definitely leaves a lot of questions for people about when are they going to think about that cleanup stage? So I'll touch upon some of these things in the next slides. Um, I think generally we want to rethink our garden cleanup by, you know, I know that um, leaves are usually blown to the edges of our woodlands. They're bagged up and taken away sometimes to a compost facility, but even so we're taking away this precious resource that actually could be mulch in our garden beds. Um, and I know that many of us feel like, you know, there's not enough space to accommodate all the leaves that fall from the trees. But I want to flip this because when you think about um, trees and you, you change your values to value the native plants and trees and the wildlife in our landscapes, there aren't, it's not a matter of that the trees are producing too many leaves. If we value our trees, we want to accommodate those leaves and all the natural processes that go with them. Um, so I think Valuing trees means making sure that they stay there, not taking out mature trees, allowing younger trees to grow healthfully. And then also, you know, if we can shrink our lawns and reduce pavement space, those sidewalks, those driveways, 
the roadside, so those parking lots, then we will have more planting beds and areas to accommodate the leaves to go. So especially under trees, um, I think thinking of leaves as mulch is perfect because if you think about it, many of those pollinators drop down from the trees um, and actually spend the winter or some part of their life cycle in the leaf litter. Um, so if you have a tree, under the tree is the perfect place to leave those leaves. Um, we also might still have an excess of leaves or a feeling of an excess. So after you've you know, taken the first step to reduce your lawn, created more planting bed area, maybe reduce pavement because that's also area that's not gonna absorb stormwater as well and that's gonna create more runoff. Um, you might still have more leaves than you can accommodate. So you don't wanna smother your plantings with too many leaves, um, but you can compost your leaves. That really shrinks them, shrinks the volume of your leaves kind of dramatically. And this is kind of a fun thing that when I, I was a, the horticulturist at Garden in the Woods for a period of time in Framingham, Massachusetts, that's Native Plant Trust Botanical Garden. And we grew all native species there. And we worked with volunteers to create this like leaf fence um, um, at one point, and uh, we filled these kind of chicken wire columns with um, leaves, and that was a good way to kind of take up the extra leaves that we had. Um, and then they broke down so fast that we had to keep filling them. And it, you know, you find really quickly if you whether you put them into a pile or into you know a, or creative situation like a fence. Um, you actually have a hard time coming up with enough leaves to um, to keep. So I find I actually find leaves are a high commodity. They I go to my neighbor's gardens and try to find more leaves, um, and because they, they keep breaking down. But they it can become a living fence over time. So as the leaves break down, it creates organic matter and a good compost and native species like. Um, Celandine poppy or wood poppy or asters and goldenrods can seed into at least starting out the lower spots where the soil has started. So I, I really like thinking about, you know, getting creative with uh, all the different things that come that we usually think of as waste products that come from our gardens and doing something interesting with them. Another option for kind of consolidating those leaves is to shred them. And I, I know this has become more popular recently. Um, people have electric shredders. That's an electric shredder that I use um, at my family's house. Um, and you can do this, uh, but and it's a good middle ground, but it's still something that's harmful to small creatures. So um, it does create a more kind of refined look for the leaves. They break down nicely and um, it looks a bit more like mulch when you shredded them up and then put them back on your garden beds. But usually if you're doing this in the fall or early spring, um, you are going to be compromising some of those small creatures that need to be not disturbed in the leaf litter. So um, definitely consider that. And then, you know, I think thinking about where the leaves blow um, is important. Um, so I think when, when we're when we're trying to replan and um, reconfigure our workload management at different times of year and think about fostering wildlife, we do have to kind of rethink, you know, just how we, if we're going to clean up uh, and where to put our resources and energy. So usually the leaves um, I find accumulate in certain areas more and then kind of blow off other areas. So those more convex, um, hills and um, bumps in the landscape are places where the leaves don't stay as long. Um, they don't accumulate. And so I think you can have certain types of plants, um, like the, the plants that are ground covers that are really low or ground hugging or more delicate that would have trouble coming up through a thick layer of leaves planted in those kinds of areas. And then in the, in the bowl shaped or the concave, you know, valleys and um, low areas in the landscape where the leaves tend to accumulate. Um, that's where, you know, you might plant more strong stemmed um, plants like blue cohosh and comb flowers and bug banes, things that can, you know, pierce up through a thicker layer of leaves. Um, so that's one strategy for, you know, not just um, consolidating your leaves or, but thinking about, you know, 
there are some areas where the leaves are going to kind of blow into and stay and be in, in an excess. But in the in the spring, I think that's when I usually take time to remove the leaves from where they've gotten stuck in shrubs or behind rocks. And I just do it very carefully right before we have too much emergence coming up. So I'm not crushing anything. But, you know, surprisingly, a lot of native plants, even the delicate looking ones come up through leaves very easily. So even like the spring beauty is one of um, the ephemerals that's up right now, um, as long, along with trout lilies. If you walk into the woods and some of the um, more moist areas in the woods along stream sides, and in rich woodlands, you're gonna find trout lily leaves. They, they look kind of leathery and they're spotted. Um, so, you know, they're really beautiful. They, they grow in masses, but they have no problem coming up through leaf litter. Same with blue cohosh and early meadow rue. Um, th these plants are coming up through a good four to six inches of leaf litter. Um, and, I'm going to move on a little bit from this, even though you could, I could talk about leaves forever. Um, and you can ask me more questions about that later. But I also think leaving the leaves and the fallen sticks and the logs is going to be really important for those um, decomposers in the landscape that oftentimes birds are actually going after piles of sticks and brush um, throughout the winter, especially cat birds, the ones that stick around um, and don't migrate south for the winter because there's actually a lot of insects in those spaces. And then you also, if you leave logs and sticks like a fallen oak log, a freshly fallen oak log will potentially have chicken of the woods an edible mushroom growing out of it or form, form beautiful moss over it. Um, I really like this sculpture that was created at Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, Gary Smith, who's a landscape architect and works with a lot of public gardens, um, designed this and he just sketched it up. And then um, with the work of, you know, six volunteers, half a dozen volunteers, he went out into the woods and they dragged um, fallen leaves and, and branches, or sorry, fallen sticks and branches into this beautiful sinuous um, sculpture called Hidden Valley. And that kind of weaves its way up and down this, um, this little dell. And it shows off the topography of the landscape, but also shows people that you can kind of rearrange if you have a woodlot or you have a section of woods in your backyard, you can rearrange the, the um, woody debris without cleaning it up too much. You can make it look intentional, um, but just not take it away because you don't want to take that stuff away. It's really important for a wide range of species. And you can make, you know, intentional piles of sticks. Um, you can also use your prunings um, or, you know, freshly um, broken branches to create wattle fences, which I think are really cool looking. There's a lot of things that you can do if you get creative. And I want to kind of start to wind down and end on the, a note about, you know, leaving other types of uh, vegetation up as long as you can. So I, I think, you know, we could stop mowing our landscapes um, as much as we do and convert them into layers of native plants like meadows or woodlands. Um, there's so many beautiful species that could take the places of our lawns. Um, and when we do that, I think we can leave um, a lot of those, that vegetation up over the winter, the grasses, comb flowers and other um, wildflowers that have seeds are really important for finches and other small birds that need seed over the winter. Um, and they also provide some places for cover um, for small mammals, et cetera. Um, you know, if you're thinking about uh, whether a plant is going to start seeding around your garden, you might want to cut it back. Um, but if you want a plant to do that, like milkweed, I think we can't, um, we can't have too much milkweed in the world. And, you know, maybe for a larger space, the common milkweed, we can let seed around. And for a smaller garden, we can have things like butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed, which are more tidier garden friendly plants. Um, I really love the seed heads of a lot of grasses, native grasses that a lot of people don't know about. So one of my favorites is 
um, bushy blue stem, um, which is kind of a mid height grass. It gets up to about three feet tall and it turns a beautiful pink salmon color in the winter. This is in January that I took this photo in the middle. Um, and it has these really fluffy seed heads. So I like to keep, leave it, let them seed around as much as possible, and then collect some of the stems for, um, for you know, um, native arrangements through the winter. And the Northern sea oats has this flattened seed head. So when you let it go by um, and go to seed, it actually, the whole plant will turn a nice bronzy color and the flattened seed head kind of waves in the wind. So, you know, you can let these plants stay, the grasses and the coneflowers and the asters are really important for forage for birds over the winter. And letting um, as well other types of stems um, stay up like elderberries, flowering raspberry, joe pie weed, um, cone, echinacea, purple cone flower. Um, letting those kinds of plants stay up is important. Those are species that have kind of hollow or pithy stems. And a lot of our native bees will nest in these stems. Um, so I want to kind of show you an example of, you know, what you could do in terms of if you do need to cut things back, a better time to cut them back to um, how to host more native pollinators, especially bees. So I, I recommend going to Heather Holmes website, which is called Pollinators Native Plants. She's done a lot of great research research on native pollinators and um, the plants that support them. And she has some great infographics on, you know, how to think about when to cut back, when to not cut back. Um, so generally for bees, they actually will, um, uh, different species are uh, going to have different timelines, but bees will, you know, nest in, the, the adult bees will nest in the stems of some of these plants over the winter and then they'll lay their eggs in these plants at some point during the growing season. So at any given time, there could be bees nesting in these stems. So a good you know, rule of thumb is to wait until we have um, about five days in a row that are above 50 degrees, even at night, until we cut back uh, those plants. So it might say for a purple coneflower, for example, you can cut them back at kind of varying heights to make sure that you're accommodating different species of bees that are gonna be in there. Um, and that will ensure that, you know, the bees can fly out, but you're not necessarily cutting the stems back before they have a chance to fly out. And then throughout the growing season, the, the plant is gonna grow and that that fresh vegetation will cover up those stems. So it won't be an aesthetic issue um, during the middle of the growing season. And then you wanna leave those things up throughout the winter um, so that you continue to host wildlife um, throughout the winter. So that's a really um, kind of nice rule of thumb and I find that an easy one to follow. Other types of nesting opportunities um, include the ground um, also uh, snags or leaving standing dead trees. Um, I especially like, this is actually the coastal sampling garden at garden in the woods. So if you think of a coastal area, it's going to have a lot of exposed soil, which is very different from a woodland kind of habitat. But a lot of times that goes with the plants that grow there, um, you know, that like sandier exposed soils that actually support the pollinators that thrive in that type of habitat anyway. So in, in those kinds of soils, um, the, there's uh, pollinators like the digger wasp, which I really love watching. It's not a, one of those wasps that stings you um, really readily. That would be like the paper wasps. Um, but this one is a ground nesting wasp. And it actually, I see it all over our native spotted bee balm, which is a really cool looking native plant. It's a very Dr. Seuss-like native plant, but it, the, the native um, spotted bee balm has these little yellow speckled flowers and these large kind of pink bracts around the flowers to draw in the pollinator. And the, blue, the great digger wasps are kind of blue and iridescent. So I really love kind of watching the, those pollinators on the bee balm. And I think that's kind of another piece of, of native plant gardening is that you have 
these beautiful plants, but then you also have the pollinators as another layer of interest and something to watch and observe. So that goes much more beyond having an ornamental, beautiful, big flower with nothing landing on it for forage um, or, or pollen. So um, also painted turtles and other species of turtles really like nesting in sandier soil. So you do have some sandier patches of soil. I suggest you know, leaving some areas bare so that you can have um, spaces for nesting for these species. And then um, overall, I think outside of the gardeny things that you're doing, you can also just do some very low hanging fruit like um, to just add opportunities and decrease harm for all the different creatures that would be in your in your garden um, or moving through your garden. So that might be just adding window well covers to your basement windows, just so small creatures like frogs and salamanders don't fall in and get trapped. Um, you wanna make sure that they don't have a chance to get in at all. Putting low or motion sensor lights out rather than big blaring you know, street lights or um, sidewalk lights is really important because not only for our night skies to be a lot darker, but um, a lot of our moths actually fly at night and they're, that's when they're looking for their partner to, to reproduce or mate. So if they get distracted by a light, then they're going to have that cycle interrupted. Also having any kind of water feature is nice. It can be a still water feature, but if you have something that's bubbling or has some sort of sound, um, then that's actually going to attract migrating birds in the spring and the fall and to your yard. And then in turn, if you have native plants to, um, for them to feed on, then um, they're going to have all the more reason to stay. I really like this example that I have on the right. This is um, somebody who's really done a great job rewilding their yard in Western Massachusetts. And they actually created some um, some ponds and a couple layers of ponds, actually they feed into each other. Um, but first the, they channeled the water from the roof to come off the roof into this little satellite dish. And that creates a nice water feature in and of itself. And then it drains into the pond and the pond is um, both filtering the water and actually hosting a lot of habitat for birds and snakes and salamanders and frogs and all sorts of different wildlife. Um, so with they have native plants planted all around it. So I really like kind of looking at this kind of systems approach. At the end of all this, I think the thing that we can do to start to spread the word is to maybe put up um, yard signs that describe, you know, some piece of what you're doing, letting people know that this is intentional and um, that, you know, you have very specific reasons for leaving your leaves. Maybe passersby will take interest, maybe even your neighbors. I think um, sharing what you are doing with people in a non-confrontational way is the way to go. Um, and I think the more of us that can join together to create whole neighborhoods that are rewilded um, is best because then we'll have these connected pieces of, of habitat um, for pollinators and other wildlife to move through. So I hope everyone tonight feels inspired to take the pledge. You can visit our website to do that. And I'll just leave you with a few um, resource slides. I'll breeze through because I will send a PDF. So don't feel like you have to write all this down. I'll send a PDF of the presentation afterwards that um, maybe Riley can distribute for me. Um, and there's a sneak peek at our native ground covers guide. Um, it's coming out pretty soon. So um, members will actually have it sent to their address directly. And then otherwise people can purchase it from our website. So thank you everyone. I'm um, open to questions now. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, yes, absolutely. I will be sending out all of these resources and uh, the PDF of the slides. Um, We'll move into the Q&A session now. I'm aware of the time. So if anybody has to leave us soon, feel free to go. Um, and it's been so nice to host you. Anna has graciously said she'll stay on for a couple of minutes extra because um, we're, we're definitely going over time now. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, hey, no worries, no worries. Um, so we've been collecting questions both before and during the 
um, lecture. If you have any now, um, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, we're Becky and I are working in the back room, and we're we're collecting all of the all of the questions and organizing them into themes. And uh, one theme that um, has popped up is trying to trying to find the balance between rewilding principles and controlling for invasives, as well as like unwanted insects and animals. Um, do you have any tips? I guess we'll start with with invasives. Um, do you have any tips for getting rid of invasives like a barberry um, and helping native plants compete with those? Yeah, so I think that it, it goes hand in hand. I think so. Um, I don't want people to think that what I when I talk about rewilding that I think we should just let everything be and go to its own devices and, you know, just stop mowing and don't do anything. I think there are some there's different strategies for different types of landscapes and different goals. So um, I think that if you do have invasive species in a place that you would like to rewild, it's really important that you take care of the invasive species before you even start planting. So that means I think there's several mechanical methods that I really like that a homeowner could use for removing invasive species. And it really depends on the particular plant um, and it's the way it reproduces and what it requires to be completely removed from a site. So I, there is a really good resource on um, the Native Plant Trust website. I think if you just search um, invasive species on their website, it should come up. Um, and I can always provide that resource afterwards. I can send a link to it. But I think smothering is one of the ways to go for invasive species. If you have a um, isolated patch of something like Japanese knotweed or um, bittersweet or barberry, I think you, you got to mow it down first and then you can cover it with like a really thick black plastic or I've even heard of people using um, old carpets, which are even thicker than black plastic and, you know, tipping them upside down or flipping them over. Um, and that can be a great way to, to do that. Now you need to do that for, you need to smother it for at least a, a year. Some, for some species, it might take even more than that. Um, some species you can mow persistently um, and that means mowing at least every couple weeks during the growing season. And a lot of these mechanical methods do take a lot of time and attention. So it's really important to know. Um, with some, that might be some, for something like Japanese knotweed, mowing persistently. It does have a really deep root system and it might take mowing for several years every couple weeks. So it's tough stuff. Um, you can do you know, pulling, um, pulling bittersweet seedlings, definitely for like your garden. If you have seedlings coming up, you know, you want to learn to identify those seedlings. Um, once, when you start to learn all the different species, you can start to get a sense for what something looks like, you know, when it's a seedling, when it's a um, little bit, you know, older and when it's a mature plant. So first you might start seeing bittersweet in some natural areas, you know, completely growing around a tree. As it gets to that stage, you, you really don't want it to get that late in the game before you start removing it. But if it gets to that stage, you might have to cut that down or just cut it, but not pull it down because uh, you can't really do that. And then um, try to mechanically remove it, or sometimes people do use herbicide. I, I try not to advocate for using herbicide if possible, but um, sometimes in some circumstances, that's probably the only way to get rid of something. Um, and then for Japanese barberry is relatively easy to pull, so is glossy buckthorn. Um, but there is a nice method for glossy buckthorn that was developed called buckthorn bags, where you do cut it um, if it's really large down to like waist height, and then you cover it with, a, a just a, a big, it's like a, this heavy duty plastic bag. And it basically cuts off the plant's ability to vote, you know, regrow and photosynthesize from one year to the next. So you can leave it like that for several years and let it just die naturally. And that doesn't disturb the soil and churn up more weed seeds. So it's a whole topic unto itself. Um, and I'm not an invasive plant expert, but that is a really important thing to do before you start planting. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. No, that was a very thorough answer. Um, 
Uh, how about for uh, like controlling for populations of, of pests like ticks um, yeah. without, without mowing? Well, so, okay, so I think there's uh, like a broader ecological perspective that I take on that. Um, so I think rewilding, I don't think that's necessarily going to increase like the number of ticks overall in the landscape. There's a lot of different factors um, that are increasing populations of ticks, like climate change, warming climate, they're able to move more northward. Um, we have high populations of deer and the white-footed mouse because we have a lack of predators in the Northeast. Those are some species that actually transport ticks. So um, I think if there is space in, the, in natural areas, hunting deer is actually a really good thing to do um, to try to you know, lower the deer populations in lieu of a predator. Um, I also think increasing habitat and large connected pieces of habitat is going to bring more habitat for predators because a lot of predators need bigger patches of habitat in order to, to you know, um, for their territory. So that would increase, you know, um, hawks and foxes and um, coyotes. And unfortunately, we don't really have wolves anymore in the Northeast, except for the coyotes are mixed with wolves. So I guess that technically counts um, to, to prey upon some of those species that, that move ticks around. And we also would have more habitat for possums, things like that, that actually eat ticks um, if we have more habitat. So having more habitat does not necessarily increase the presence of ticks, but having, you know, taller vegetation closer to your house. Um, yeah, you might become in contact with them more often. And um, I think like, you know, just make sure that your paths are nice and wide, like three to four feet. So if you do have a meadow and you have a mowed path through the meadow, make sure it's a nice wide path. So whenever you're going through the meadow, you're not always coming into contact with, with um, ticks. But otherwise, I think, you know, if you're an outdoor person and you get out into the woods regularly, um, into natural areas regularly, you're going to be coming into contact with ticks anyway. So I'd just take all the same precautions you would when going out into your backyard versus going out into the woods. Awesome, awesome, thanks. Um, there was a question uh, that is uh, wild seed project specific, and this one might be an, an easy one to answer. Um, mm -hmm. Someone was on the Wild Seed Project website to order seeds, um, but most of the choices said that they're out of stock right now. Um, are those going to be restocked or is there, are there any other wild seed stockers you would recommend? Yeah, so I think that um, a lot of our seeds are out of stock because we're replenishing um, after like our main seed season that we like to promote is the late fall through winter. So about mid-November through January. That's the main time to, to sow native seeds. We recommend them sowing them into pots so that you have a higher rate, a success rate for your seedlings, um, rather than direct sowing them into the ground. And most of them need a cold win, uh, winter in order to break their dormancy, break their hard seed coats, and to start stimulate germination. So if you actually planted them or sowed them in the spring, they wouldn't have that winter and they probably wouldn't come up until the following spring. You'd have a, a whole year gap. So now is the time to plant, you know, certain species like some asters and um, coneflowers and lobelias and things like that can be planted still now um, into the end of April or so. But most of our um, native plants, actually, it's best to sow them in that fall winter period. Um, so more will come back and stock starting um, in the summer and then through September and October, and then we'll have the most plants in stock in the fall. Awesome. Um, one, uh, a question came in uh, from when you were talking about, and I'm going to mess up this word, the neonicotinoids. Actually, no, I think I got it. You got it. <laughs> um, do, do seeds from plants treated with neon, neonicotinoids still have that pesticide in them? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if there's been research on that at this point, so I can't really answer that, but um, I'm, I'm guessing it probably wouldn't. Usually the fruits of a plant um, don't always contain as much of a 
a toxin like lead, for instance, um, not that you would want to eat a, the fruit of a plant that um, is growing in, in soil that has is contaminated with lead, but the lowest levels of lead are going to be found in the fruit usually. Um, I don't know if that is the same for neonicotinoids, but uh, it's an educated guess, but I definitely wouldn't, uh, I would stay on the safe side no matter what, um, and just try to get better sourced plants because those neonicotinoids are, you know, they're, they're really responsible also for, they're one of the things that are responsible for colony collapse for bees and um, a lot of uh, the downfall of a lot of our pollinators. So just stay away from them in general. Awesome. Um, so Gail asked a really good and nuanced question. Um, so one of the challenges is people like attractive gardens. So how do you accept, how do you accept defoliation, holes in plant leaves and leaf litter? Should you plant more caterpillar host plants so not all are eaten? Or will that attract more butterflies and moths that will lay eggs and there will be more caterpillars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I think, yeah, when you start really heavily um, planting native species and, and pushing the balance towards natives, you probably will notice um, some munching and on your leaves. And that's, it's not a bad thing, I know. And I think you recognize that when you ask the question, of course, but um, I don't think it's going to generally for most species to an, be an extreme extent where you're gonna see just tons of holes all over the plant at all times. There might be certain times when like, a, for I'll give you a good example. So there, you know, the um, plantain leaf pussy toes and other species of pussy toes are a host plant for the American lady butterfly, which is absolutely gorgeous. Actually, one of the slides, um, I think the, the, the where to buy native plant slide had an American lady butterfly on it. Um, and those are actually, you know, heavily reliant on plants in that family. So pearly everlasting and pussy toes are some of its favorites. It lays its eggs on the leaves in the spring and then the caterpillars hatch and they, they actually can kind of look like they're crinkling up the leaf or like folding it. And if you open up the leaf, it has this protective webbing around it and the caterpillar, sometimes you can't see the caterpillar, but you can find the frass inside, which is its poop. Um, and it will start to really make an impact on the plant, especially if you get, have a high population of American ladies in your area, you're gonna have a lot of munching. And so it will look a little bit defoliated or just the leaves won't look healthy for you know a portion of the spring. But then once those caterpillars pupate and then become butterflies, which they all kind of do at the same time by mid um, June or so, the plant has a chance to regenerate its leaves. And by the middle of the summer, it looks like nothing phased it. So, um, you know, I think that it's, it's something to expect and to start to maybe appreciate. Like, I, I just like to use that as an opportunity to enjoy to see, you know, seeing the life cycle of another species. Um, but it's, I don't think it's going to happen for all your plants all at the same time. I think a lot of things are still going to look beautiful a lot of the time in your garden. Awesome. So to be respectful to, uh, to Anna and her time, uh, we're going to do one more question. Um, and that question, I wanted to end on, on a really uh, wholesome one. So this one was asked before the, uh, before the lecture. What are uh, your five best native plant recommendations for a preschool butterfly garden? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question. I think there's so many fun plants for school gardens in general. And so I wanna point you to a resource, another resource on our website. It's called Favorite Plants for Schoolyards. And um, it's in our plant list. So if you just search that in uh, once you get to our website, you should find it. And I'll post all these resources. But for a butterfly garden specifically, I think look for things that are showy and beautiful and kind of um, um, going to be eye-catching for kids, but also that are going to have a really nice story to go with them. So I think of any milkweed would be great for a school garden, but um, for like a sunny, drier site, I would pick butterfly milkweed, which is has bright orange flowers and it's a little bit more tidy and short. 
Um, or if you have a wet spot, I think the swamp milkweed is really beautiful and it's fragrant. And those, you know, foster the monarch butterfly as well as the common milkweed. And then they also, not just the monarch butterfly, but a host of other species of pollinators. So um, that would be a great one. I think that any asters, like New England aster is one of our showiest asters. And that has a lot of, that has a lot of caterpillars and a lot of butterflies, bees and wasps and, and moths. Um, on its flowers as well. And I'd say pussy toes would be another good one because I like that it has a good story with the American lady butterfly. Is that four so far or three? <laughs> I've lost track. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think like um, anything whimsical too. I think a good one, another good one would be nodding onion because it's an edible species and um, has kind of lavender colored flowers that attract a lot of different pollinators. And red columbine actually attracts um, hummingbirds and has these kind of dangling flowers that are like upside down flowers. So those would be some of my choices, but you could really go with so many different species. Um, and a lot of our plants, you know, for a pollinator garden, could be those species that don't necessarily just have showy flowers that attract pollinators. Like I said, it could be trees and shrubs um, or other species that are good for a wide range of pollinators and host um, the caterpillars on their leaves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you everyone uh, who joined us tonight. Um, all of our lectures can be found in our virtual learning library online and on Kelt's YouTube. Um, and we will be emailing out the recording and the slides and a whole bunch of resources uh, that Anna mentioned tonight. Um, so that concludes our evening. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye.